our last session of PGS 2021 out of 25. Our guests are representatives in California, Sweden, the UK, and they live in Germany and Poland. We are closing this conference with a topic that is deeply intertwined with all summit themes, from democracy to the Green New Deal to eliminating economic inequalities. This session will bring the themes from the past three days all together. The session is chaired by Anna Gromada. Anna, over to you. Hello, uh, the world was already unequal before COVID. With the arrival of the pandemic, we've witnessed inequalities exacerbated along the well-known socioeconomic lines. But what does it mean for future generations? Together with the University of Konstanz and Arana Gruppen, we are welcoming you at the panel International Justice and Social Mobility Post-COVID. We want to create this session for you, but also with you. Please register to pose questions in the chat box so I could pose them to our distinguished guests who include Professor Marius Busemeyer, Professor of Political Science at the University of Konstanz, Annelies Dotz, Chair of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, Robert Rivas, Member of the California State Assembly, and Ardelan Shekarabi, Minister for Social Security in Sweden. Now, I'd like to invite Professor Busemeyer to set the scene with his latest research on perceptions of inequality in Germany. Yes, thank you very much Anna, for the nice introduction and welcome to everybody to this uh, last but not least session, if you could put it like that. So this is obviously a very important topic, inequality, intergenerational justice and social mobility. So we have a little presentation prepared I guess, Florian, you will launch it at some point. Uh, there you go. Um, so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity since the session is also co-sponsored by us here, uh, the University of Konstanz, uh, as well as the, especially the cluster of excellence on the politics of inequality. Next slide, please. Um, what is this cluster of excellence? It's uh, one of the uh, about 47 clusters of excellence that are supported with uh, extra funding from the federal government in the context of the German excellence strategy and one of the very few who are focusing on social science issues. Um, we are focusing especially on the political causes and consequences of inequality and this feedback cycle here is our conceptual framework which shows the areas of our research. Especially we are interested in how is inequality perceived both nationally and globally uh, and we pay spe special attention to the fact that sometimes inequality may be perceived as less uh, severe than it actually is. I'm going to come back later uh, uh, to this topic. Then we study how these perceptions of inequality might be related to political participation and mobilization, for instance, triggering social protests, uh, but also affecting uh, uh, the willingness of people to contribute politically. And finally, we study how policymakers actually react to these perceived inequalities do they respond to certain interest groups, to certain political interests uh, uh, in a more favorable way than to others? Is there an additional layer of discrimination, so to speak? Um, this class of excellence is a pretty big thing. We have more than 100 people involved in this, principal investigators, postdoc researchers, doctoral researchers. We have uh, fellowship programs for visiting guests, uh, both um, on the doctoral, postdoctoral, and also the senior level. Uh, we have uh, researchers from political science, economics, uh, linguistics, sociology, education research. We are looking at inequalities in income, education, and also participation rights. Next slide. And one of the about 22 projects that we're doing is uh, the so-called inequality barometer. And this is, this is a special project because it's very important for the cluster in general. It um, is a repeated survey of the perceptions of inequality and social mobility among the German resident population, we want to measure and gauge what Germans in that uh, regard think about inequality and how these perceptions of inequality are related to their attitudes towards politics, for instance. 
Um, we, ha we did a first wave despite the restrictions of the corona pandemic in late 2020, and we will do further waves um, in, in every two years. Uh, we have 6,000 respondents in this survey so that we can really explore the regional variation in perceptions and preferences. Next slide, please. And one of the, uh, so I, I cannot go into all details here, but I wanted to just uh, to, to get the discussion going on this important topic, wanted to highlight a few of the, the most important findings from our uh, first wave of this inequality barometer. And this slide shows you um, the perceptions of uh, people as they put themselves uh, on the uh, uh, income ladder, so to speak. So on the left-hand side, uh, you can see how the income ladder actually looks like in Germany. And on the right-hand side, you can see how people perceive themselves uh, uh, or their own position on this income ladder. And as you can see, relatively speaking, you see a compression of these perceptions, meaning that uh, the rich basically uh, underestimate, underestimate their richness and the poor over underestimate their poverty. Um, so that means that Germans actually think that they are much more centered in the middle, clustered in the middle. They all belong to the middle class, so to speak, uh, uh, while in fact inequality is, is much larger. So this uh, shows that inequality, even though a lot of people care about it and it's uh, discussed as an important political problem, that people often uh, underestimate the true extent of inequality, especially income inequality. We also have uh, questions about wealth inequality in the survey, and here the results are even more concerning, if you want to put it like that, because uh, compared to income inequality, wealth inequality is even more underestimated in Germany. People, uh, uh, because it's, it's very difficult to grasp, it's not so tangible, people really have a difficult, have some difficulty understanding the extent of wealth inequality. And they actually think that wealth inequality is less pronounced than income inequality, whereas it's uh, just the, the opposite. Wealth inequality is about three times higher in um, uh, than income inequality in Germany. So that, that already shows that there are lots of misperceptions about uh, income inequality out there. Next slide, please. Um, here we ask people uh, about the society they want to live in and the society they think they live in. So we showed them here on the left-hand side, uh, you see these pictures of pyramids in various shapes. We showed them these pictures of distributions of income, life chances, um, and so on. And we asked them um, two questions first. In which society do you think you are living in Germany? How does the distribution of resources look like? And then on the right hand side, what do what would you like to uh, like it to look like? What are your aspirations? What would be an ideal uh, distribution? And here you can see, without going too much into detail, that people actually in that regard tend to be too pessimistic about inequality because they think that Germany mostly looks like Type A or Type B with a large working class, large uh, lower income class where in fact it's more empirically something like type C, uh, but they generally would really like it to look like type D or even type E. So to have a much more egalitarian distribution of income than, than they actually perceive it to be. Next slide, please. Then, uh, as I said, this uh, barometer, the survey allows us to uh, look at the regional variations of perceptions of uh, social mobility, especially. So here we have a map of the distribution of these perceptions across different regions in Germany. And um, the interesting thing, thing here is that the patterns only partly match to what you would think uh, um, uh, or would assume if you don't know anything about uh, what this might look like. So on the left-hand side, we have people's worries about inequality. We simply ask them, to what extent do you care uh, about income inequality or to what extent do you worry about income inequality? And here you can see the uh, slightly darker shades in the eastern half uh, of uh, Germany, so uh, apparently, and that's the part where, you, where that fits with previous expectations, uh, that people in eastern Germany are more concerned about income inequality than people in western Germany. But then if you look at the right-hand side, we look at uh, a measure of um, perceptions of upward mobility. So this is basically a measure that asks people whether they think it's likely that, that children from the lower quintile in the income distribution will make it to the top uh, over uh, their lifetimes. And uh, you can see also some pessimism in uh, the eastern half of Germany, in the, especially in Saxony, um, so in the uh, uh, southwest, southeast. But uh, the northern half actually looks pretty optimistic and quite surprisingly also to us, 
perceptions of upward social mobility are quite pessimistic in, in southern Germany as well, uh, including the area here in Konstanz, uh, which is actually a very wealthy area in Germany. So we interpret this finding as indicating that uh, also where the local economies are pretty strong, where you have strong local knowledge economies, uh, people might be wor less worried about income mobility, but they are getting more worried about the perspectives of upward mobility. And we have additional questions in the survey, for instance, about housing concerns and so on. And you can really see that there are uh, concerns about uh, status competition, concerns about limited uh, upward mobility chances, uh, also in, in economic wealthy areas, simply because the competition is so much more severe in these areas. So that's maybe an, an angle to discuss further in the Q&A later on. Next and final slide, please. What does this mean in terms of policy implications? I think uh, first important point here is that people are really worried about inequality. That's that's clear from our survey, but <clears throat> they often still perceive it uh, 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 or misperceive it in to, to a significant extent. They often underestimate it, especially the extent of wealth inequality. Uh, Germans are also quite pessimistic about social mobility than in other countries. Um, uh, uh, and I've just learned of a, a survey that the uh, Progressives Centrum did uh, as well, uh, using a different sample. They come up with quite similar findings. Uh, and that these strong local economies might actually ex ex exacerbate these concerns about upward mobility. So to put it in a more positive note, I think what the, especially for the purposes of this session, the survey also shows rather untapped potential for um, support for progressive and redistributive policies because uh, people, if they were properly informed about the true extent of inequality, they would probably also uh, support more uh, uh, redistributive policies to, to do something about it, such as introducing a wealth tax or maybe increasing inheritance taxation. So this is it uh, from my side, from the, from the research input, and I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with you and the panelists. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Busemoya. Now I'd like to kick off the discussion with our guests. Um, all of you tackle inequalities, either as politicians or as intellectuals. So I'd like to start with a personal question. What has inspired you to fight for this particular cause, for equality and social mobility? Yeah, your others can come in. Uh, oh, there's a there's a bit of an echo actually. M maybe I can move a little closer, and that won't disturb us. Sorry. Um, I I'm really interested in what the others would have to say uh, around this question. But um, I, I suppose I'm someone who's become even more committed, I suppose, to this agenda over time. Um, particularly as I've had my own children, and I've seen very clearly quite how different the circumstances are for you know very very young children in the uk dependent upon their family circumstances um so uh, you know i suppose i was i was brought up in a kind of middle class uh, background you know had the kind of opportunities that you would expect to go alongside that i now live in a working class area of what we would call a council estate so um you know social housing uh, that was built with the whole mixture of people but still very many on very low incomes um and certainly within the uk those kind of distinctions are, are very clear from the beginning and uh, i think uh, not only is it's the aspiration to change that but the anger uh, that i have about the the missed opportunities and the missed potential um that really drives me to try and act politically against inequality um but as i said really interested to hear what the others have to say about this as well Thank you. Hi, so um, I'd be happy to go next. My name is Robert Rivas and uh, serve in the uh, California State Legislature. And, and you know, I, I think it's a great question. And I think what motiv what 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 um, has motivated me is, you know, I grew up in poverty. And so I was raised by a family of immigrant farm workers who came to the United States, who came to California from Mexico in the 1960s. I was raised by my grandparents, raised by my mom, who was a single parent. Um, and having uh, the opportunity now to serve in the legislature uh, and to be part of 
um, a, a legislative body that 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 can make a significant difference in the lives of others. You know, I can um, just relate to the experiences I had as a child, having lived in farm worker housing, having lived in poverty. Um, you know, but having grown up in a very loving home, uh, where my grandfather would tell me every day that anything was possible if I worked hard, um, and you know, certainly that's what I did. Um, but reflecting on the circumstances and the situations and and those examples that we see today so many families so many children have it much more difficult than i ever had it uh, and so certainly that's what motivates me is 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 to um you know i may not have the answers to everything uh, but i could talk about my experience and i could talk about certainly fighting for our most vulnerable families and children which is what i have done in my uh, short time in the california legislature thank you Ardalan Shekharavi, would you like to share us, share with us your, your personal inspirations for the fight for equality and social mobility? Thank you. And, and progressive forces in parliament in the Social Democratic Party, uh, Sweden could be transformed to, a, to an equal welfare state during maybe three de decades. And uh, this was made be without any violence, without any revolution, because uh, the labor movement could uh, uh, maximize the support for the idea of, of equality and, and welfare state. So, the Swedish history and what uh, the labor movement in this country managed to do during the 20th century is a good source of inspiration for me. Thank you, that's very interesting. So we've heard the stories about parenthood, children, history of Sweden and of the migration to the United States. Do you have your own uh, story, Professor Busemeyer? Well, uh, I mean, I think, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, uh, I have to say, uh, I, compared to many other people, I had a pretty privileged uh, education. I mean, not super privileged, but solid middle class background. Although I could say that coming from a very small village in uh, the western part of Germany, my uh, my grandfather uh, was, a, was a tailor, my grandmother was a farmer. So it's actually not that long ago that we had this uh, educational opportunities in, in Germany um, and uh, um, and that, that especially the generation of my parents went through a massive uh, educational expansion phase. So uh, my father uh, didn't uh, finish uh, secondary school with an abitur, but he decided to take an apprenticeship uh, first and then ended up at university and then got a, got a university degree in the end and, and made, a, made a, a really nice career afterwards. Um, and this is the kind of upward social mobility that was possible in Germany in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I would say. And uh, for my parents, it, the, the most important thing is, was to get a university education. And if once you have that education, you're, you're all set for the rest of your life. That was the perception back then. And I think this is really changing now um, uh, in, in, the, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, where you see a lot of um, concern uh, among uh, uh, young, uh, the younger generation, especially, um, that uh, the, the pro prospect of upward mobility is no longer as solid as it used to be, and that status competition is is getting more uh, pressing concern uh, regarding housing, especially. Uh, so people, it's it's a very mixed bag. On the one hand, people, and we actually also have that in our survey where we ask people, how would you compare your uh, chances regarding travel, housing, income, education to the previous generation. It's very mixed. So people think in terms of traveling the world and, and uh, education, things are improving, but not necessarily with regard to housing uh, and some uh, some basic things like employment security. So there are really some, some uh, big changes ongoing and uh, it, it, therefore it's a very important and timely uh, event that we really reflect on what to do with it after uh, the COVID crisis hopefully over. So your parent was a tailor, like in the House of the Rising Sun, in the 60s, where the My world was different. 
Ah, your grandmother. Yeah, my grandfather. Yeah, my, my father was an engineer, so it's uh, yeah. moving up. <laughs> Everything was different in the 60s. Music was different in the 60s. Mobility was different in the 60s. Uh, but now with COVID, uh, we have so many fronts of crisis open up, opened up. So in the context of scarce resources, uh, which of the policies do you consider the most urgent to be applied now for the sake of social mobility? And uh, this time I'd like to hear from uh, Mr. Rivas first. Sure. Yeah. And that's a great question. You know, I, you know, I'm a lifelong resident of the state of California. I'm very proud of our long history and certainly our economic prosperity here as a state. We talk often that here in California, um, you know, we talk often of our economic standing, not only within the United States, but within the world. You know, we have the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, but what a lot of people uh, don't realize is as a state, we have the highest rate of poverty in the United States. Uh, and so um, when you look at the root cause of, of this rate of poverty, uh, as the professor was just mentioning, it, it, it comes back to housing. We have a severe housing crisis in the state of California that certainly has widened our economic inequality in the state. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it certainly has, has, has impacted, um, uh, you know, um, not only our, our low income residents, our most vulnerable residents, our low wage earners, but certainly our middle income families as well. Um, when more and more families are forced to pay a, such a large percentage of their income, uh, in, in some cases, over 50% of their income on housing, on rents, um, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly has been the root cause of this high rate of poverty. It has impacted the quality of life uh, and, and, and it has really, um, uh, you know, not allowed uh, families such as my own, uh, as I mentioned, came from a farm working family. It was, you know, we lived in, 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 in farm worker housing. My grandfather made $5 an hour in the late 80s, but it was enough for him to save uh, to purchase his first and only home. And that provided my family that upward mobility. We felt we were hanging on this, you know, the bottom rung of, of, of this ladder of opportunity, but it was that, that um, you know, uh, 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 ability to, 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 to purchase our very first home as a family that provided my family with every opportunity uh, that we've had since. And so certainly we're not creating those opportunities um, uh, anymore. Uh, and so when it comes to, to focusing on addressing this housing crisis in production, uh, in affordability, um, you know, it really is um, uh, incredibly important. Uh, and, and, uh, and I say that because obviously this pandemic has exacerbated so many of these challenges and problems within our state, but certainly it has made worse uh, this issue of housing and the increasing rate of homelessness we have uh, in the state of California. Um, and so, you know, I would, um, you know, again, agree with the professor that housing, housing, housing is, um, you know, uh, the number one issue that, need, that, that we need to be focusing on here in California and throughout the United States. Okay, thank you. So housing is number one issue in California. What about Sweden, uh, Minister Shikarabi? Well, I think we must address all forms of inequalities and safeguard that everyone can access education, attain affordable health care, thrive on labor market. And people should know that in case of sickness or if you lose your job, you will not be left alone. So our social insurance are part of that safety net to leverage uh, social mobility. And that's why it's necessary to further develop such systems. In Sweden, these systems, they have been under attack. They have been questioned by new liberals at least the last decades and we've been uh, witnessing a lot of uh, limitation cuts on, on, on uh, the social security system and and that has actually financed tax cuts for for people uh, who are not in, the, in in need of social security but now when the pandemic started more than a year ago people realized that we need the, these systems and and if we believe that we will never get sick, we are wrong because we don't know if we will be in need of the social security systems. So I would say that the support for, for stronger social security and, and stronger social insurances, it has increased in Sweden a lot. And then we have to work uh, with, with uh, uh, the financial family support. In Sweden, the, the financially family support is aimed at improving the financial situation for families with children, 
during the period when they have an increased economic burden. And the goal is to reduce disparities in living conditions between households with children and those without. So we have to use this as a tool for creating a more equal and, and, and uh, safe society. It is, this is an example of how a universal welfare system help reduce differences between social groups in society, provide security and justice, and, and actually a great deal of equality is, is quite efficient way to, to, to increase equality. So universal systems also tie generations and, and different social groups closer to each other in a common security that increases the social and political stability and thereby also increases the conditions for growth in society. I think that this case uh, has been has become much stronger after this pandemic. It, 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 is, it is a situation of momentum for progressives, at least in, in Nordic countries, you can witness that very clearly. Thank you very much. So uh, it's been housing for California, social ins, uh, insurance and social security for Sweden. What about the United Kingdom? Yeah, I think when we look specifically at social mobility, I would say the, the two barriers in the UK often relate to the structure of our labour market and then also indeed to housing. I mean, just to unpack those a little bit, first of all, around our labour market, we've seen um, decreasing returns to labour over time as an overall proportion of value added, as it were, increasing returns to, to different forms of assets and re reducing returns to, uh, to labour. We've had a very long period of uh, relative stagnation of wages, so that was only starting to uh, uh, improve, really, when the crisis hit. So we'd had 10 years of uh, frozen uh, wage increases on average in the UK, um, but we'd also seen quite a big growth in precarious work, um, you know, some of which hit the headlines more in the UK, like so-called zero hours contracts, where people have very little security over how many hours they work, but also what we would call short hours. So, you know, people needing to work two or three jobs to keep their heads above water. You know, why is that a major impact and a major problem for social mobility? Well, because it locks people in to insecure situations um, it often means that they, they can't move to other parts of the country, they can't change their circumstances. Um, and of course, that's coupled then with problems with our social security system as well, which is uh, has increasingly become uh, uh, totally unfit for purpose. So there are those issues around our labour market, but they do relate often to our housing system as well. And it was fascinating to hear Robert talking about this. Um, in many parts of the country, we have similar ratios for um, families who, who will be working. So we're not talking about people who are without work. Families who are working will be paying, you know, 60 percent potentially of their income uh, into rent just to uh, have often pretty poor quality housing. And then, of course, that knocks on to all the other possible enablers of social mobility. You know, it knocks on to education, because if you're living in an overcrowded flat or in poor housing, then it's much harder for the kids to be doing their homework. It knocks on to health as well. And I suppose I, I would just end in saying that, you know, arguably inequalities in health are becoming a major issue for social mobility in the UK as well. Um, quite recently, we've reached a, a pretty appalling new development, which is that life expectancy is actually going backwards amongst some groups in the UK, uh, including very low income women, for example. Uh, so now health inequalities are becoming an issue for social mobility because obviously if somebody becomes incapacitated because of a health related issue, very, very difficult for them to be earning to the same extent as somebody uh, who hasn't been. And so their incomes immediately hit as well. Thank you. What about Germany? What would be the most pressing public policy for the sake of uh, social mobility in the in the age of COVID? I think I think the answer is pretty clear. It should be education uh, uh, from from the bottom up to to lifelong learning. So 
Um, in Germany, we had, and actually that, that was also one of my main research um, topics with uh, education politics, especially politics of education funding. And in Germany, we had, we have had for a long time underinvestment in education, uh, and it's very difficult to solve that issue, uh, both politically and, and uh, economically, I guess, even though the case for education is quite obvious. So you invest in education, you create opportunities for participation in the labor market, therefore also opportunities to, for participation in societies and so on. Um, and Germany is a rich country, so there is there is obviously a lot of uh, leeway for, for this, but it's been very hard to actually achieve that. Um, Germany, I think, has managed to do something about uh, long-term underinvestment in early childhood education and care. So there has been quite a massive expansion of this sector in the past years. There have been also some additional investments in higher education, but lifelong learning uh, remains a, a construction site in many ways, I would say. And uh, so in, in terms of the policies that should be prioritized, uh, it's pretty obvious. And, and, and the COVID crisis has really revealed also the weaknesses of the German education system uh, in, in stark ways. We've had lots of problems with uh, digitalization in the schools. Um, uh, we are now seeing, uh, of course, the huge problem of how to uh, address the emerging educational inequalities that come out of, of uh, the COVID crisis. And so far, I think policymakers have not yet come up with sustainable answers to this. So I think this will be a big priority for the new federal government coming into office in, in the fall. But I see also quite significant political risks um, that, that this issue might still not be addressed uh, properly because uh, obviously the COVID crisis will also lead to a lot of short-term needs for compensation already has uh, led to a, a huge payout of, of billions of euros for short-term aid for companies and, and uh, to keep jobs and so on. And of course, that's super important and it needs to be done. But I do see a risk that these long-term social investments in education might be um, suffering from uh, the, the fi financial uh, pressure to come somehow come up with 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 the bill uh, to, to finance all these short-term compensation measures that we've, we've already financed and we will probably still have to finance in the coming years um, so there's a risk that these social investments still get crowded out by short-term compensation policies and i think that's a huge challenge also i guess for a progressive policy agenda to make sure that that policy makers really uh, um, yeah, uh, try to implement these social investments and investments in education in particular, even though there are lots of other competing uh, fiscal pressures. Thank you very much. Um, now I have a question which is more about communicating our values. So there is a certain spectrum of political views. Uh, conservatives talk a lot about competitiveness, efficiency, progressives talk a lot about social mobility. So how would you communicate your values to voters, especially those who think differently than you do? And I'd like to start with uh, maybe a, the perspective of Minister Shekarabi. Thank you. Well, I, I think we have to focus on common interests. In Swedish context, we, we do not have uh, a welfare state because we believe in charity. Our welfare state is, is based on the idea that everyone, rich and poor, can get benefit from a society where we help each other. We can reduce uh, poverty, we can increase uh, equality, and in the same time, include people with higher incomes in, in our welfare state, in, in our different uh, social insurance intra, intra systems. So I, I think we have to find different way, ways to include conservatives and, and more right-wing oriented voters in our way to, to describe uh, the need of welfare state. It is not about charity. This is about creating a smarter, more, more sustainable, and inclusive society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rivas, so uh, in the last few years, we've heard a lot about how divided the United States have become. How would you communicate your values to people who vote differently than you do? Well, certainly, I think um, now is, you know, it's always challenging to 
you know, bridge uh, a lot of these differences. And, you know, it's what I've experienced uh, as a local elected official for eight years, but more so now as a state legislature and a, a partisan office as a Democrat. Um, and I think that there, you know, one uh, can leverage any um, strategy on, you know, reconciling these 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 issues and challenges. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, growing up, um, you know, in poverty, uh, and listening every day to my grandfather talk about hard work, how hard work would 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 result in opportunity for myself. Um, uh, but now in 2021, hard work isn't enough to create those opportunities um, for uh, this generation. Uh, and so that's why it's identifying these 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 barriers that exist within our states, within our communities, within our country, uh, and 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 doing what we can uh, to remove those barriers. Um, and what I have done is, you know, talk about my experience. Uh, I have talked, uh, you know, specifically about, as, as I mentioned, housing, one of the, the, the you know, our, our priority housing bills that, that I got bipartisan support on, um, you know, uh, was uh, around workforce housing for agricultural workers. Uh, we went out and talked about how in the most prosperous, one of the most prosperous states in the world, in California, uh, we had agricultural families uh, living in third world country conditions, a humanitarian crisis, a lot of uh, uh, undocumented farm working families and immigrants would have, have been exploited to a large extent or forced to live in these overcrowded conditions, um, four to five families in a single family home. It, and what we are seeing is we are seeing those impacts, as was mentioned by um, one of the panelists, uh, in, in educational opportunities and outcomes. Um, you know, uh, when you live in those overcrowded conditions, it's so much more difficult to, to focus and to, to concentrate on, um, you know, education and, and, uh, and you know, homelessness uh, when students are, um, you know, um, moving, you know, uh, uh, from, from a car to a shelter every night. It's, you know, it creates unequal opportunity. And so when we highlight these issues as I did, uh, we were able to get the support we needed uh, to get our uh, bill passed, but certainly it required a lot of work. Um, and, you know, so certainly that's why, you know, I mentioned that, you know, it requires leveraging these different strategies to get our message across. Thank you very much. And what about the UK? How can we convince people who vote differently than we do that there is a value in social mobility for everyone? I think it is about stressing really that common interest that was referred to a moment ago. And I would say that in, in two directions. First of all, around the, the common problems that are impacting so many people now in the UK. And then secondly, around the long-term costs that we'll all have to bear if we don't tackle some of those problems. So first of all, around the, the many insecurities now that are becoming the norm for very large numbers of people in the UK. Um, you know, traditionally, and it was very interesting uh, hearing what was said a moment ago, traditionally in the UK, um, people would not uh, be viewed as likely to fall into poverty if they were in work. Um, so uh, perhaps if somebody became unemployed, um, yes, some people would think, okay, then we could classify them as living in poverty. Actually now, the majority of children who would be classified as living in poverty in the UK are in households where their parents are working. Um, so we're seeing this kind of precariousness, insecurity becoming much more generalised. You know, so many families during this period will know of at least one member or family friend who's, um, you know, seen their income drop really pretty radically. Uh, they'll know about young people who can't get on that housing ladder. Um, you know, no matter what their background was, you know, they will know somebody who has been subject to that kind of uh, precariousness and who's discovered that there simply isn't a social security net there worth its name to support them. Um, I think also we're seeing for so many people now pressures around their work-life balance um, much more discussion and recognition of that than perhaps there was before. And again, that's opening up a debate and a discussion about some of those working rights issues, which perhaps a lot of people might not have felt really applied to them. Um, but I would say when we do that, we need to make sure really that we're talking in people's language. You know, one thing that always frustrates me is quite often um, as progressives, uh, you know, as someone on the, on the left in my case, you know, we use jargon around working rights that a lot of people might not 
realise applies to their situation that really would make a difference to their situation. Um, so first of all, it's about, as I say, showing that this is something for so many people now, it's not a minority interest really in terms of minority of the population, it's affecting so many people now. But secondly, as I said, unless we deal with those inequalities in the UK, we will see many costs stacking up for the future. I mean, we've had some excellent research done into the costs of failing to provide proper catch up, especially for disadvantaged children. Uh, we've got a really poor response from the Conservative government in the UK. Labour set out a much more wide ranging support package for those children to help them to catch up. And we know that will save money in the long run. We know that it would help our country in the long run. And the same applies to health-based inequalities as well. Um, and finally, it also, of course, applies to social security related costs. You know, about a quarter of families in the UK went into the crisis with less than a hundred pounds in the bank, you know, a really small amount of money, obviously. Um, and that meant that, of course, they had to turn to social security to support them such as it is in the UK. Now, if we had, a more secure society for people, we wouldn't have seen those costs arising. So it's in everyone's interest to deal with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's about uh, poverty becoming not the margin, but a probable norm and about investment in the future. And uh, what about Germany? We are having election time in Germany. So a good time to convince someone to your views, Ms. Uh, Professor uh, Busemeyer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, of all, I mean, uh, thanks, Annalisa, for this for this comment. I mean, this is basically also very much related to what I said before about social investment, and I it shows the difficulties of um, you know promoting social investment reforms that are more geared towards the long term. Um, uh, uh, yeah, to 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 keep them moving forward in a in a climate that's all about fiscal austerity and increasingly so. Um, so about the values question, I think that's a, of course a very important one. But given that I'm not a, a not an active politician, uh, but an, a, just a, a mere academic researcher, I, I want to maybe uh, give a slightly different uh, reply to this than the others have. So first of all, I want to just highlight that I, there is a lot of research that shows that framing, as we call it, matters. So the way you co communicate with policy make, uh, with voters really matters, and the way you frame problems and issues really matters, and especially with regard to inequality. Uh, for instance, to, put, uh, to pick a um, um, sort of maybe extreme example, if the Trump uh, administration uh, basically uh, with the Trump administration, basically it's a lot about uh, economic opportunity, about economic inequality, but then if you achieve to frame these issues of economic inequality as issues that are more about identity and uh, migrants coming to the US uh, uh, and, and, and stealing your jobs, then of course this, this is really politically, unfortunately, politically successful, at least with some voters. And I think it would be really, really important to create a convincing progressive counter narrative to this uh, populist, right-wing populist narrative that is becoming uh, so prominent uh, in the US, but also in, in many European countries. So I think that would be the first order of the day. And I think our kind of research can contribute a little bit to um, uh, helping to understand the dynamics of these framing effects and which frames might work better than, than others. And so that comes to my second point and also back to my presentation. As I said, we find that and it's not only us that find that, but there's also some research about this already out there, that people often have these misperceptions of inequality. They think it's about the problem is migration, whereas in fact, it's actually inequality uh, between the rich and the poor. And of course, that is related to, to issues such as migration, but the, the, what is the, the core source of this? It's really, uh, in many, uh, in many uh, uh, ways, it's economic inequalities. Um, and uh, I think it, it can be a pretty powerful narrative to, to go back to these uh, issues and try to inform voters about the true extent of these e economic inequalities and how they create all sorts of problems and, and what could be done to address these issues. Um, uh, especially the, the, uh, uh, this, this idea that, that Robert mentioned about the U United States, that this idea you have hardworking people are supposed to get ahead, they're supposed to be rewarded for what they've, what they've done. And this, this narrative, I mean, this, this deal, this, Amer this deal at the heart of the American dream apparently no longer works. And I think uh, that's also the case for many other countries. So this could be the starting point of a quite power powerful narrative to show we really need to uh, do something uh, to promote upward social mobility. And we need to come up with different policy ideas than we've done in the past. And before I mentioned this, this really strong focus on education, 
education. Um, uh, but it's not only about education, it's also about how to make sure that people who, are, are, who already are in precarious work situations, that they continue to have access to lifelong learning. And I think uh, in Germany especially, it's often this uh, impression that you, you just do your education, you do an proper apprenticeship at the beginning of your employment career, and then you're set for life. And I think that obviously no longer works. Uh, we need to really enable people um, to, to start up new careers uh, when they're already slightly older than 35 or 40 years uh, to, to, to stay engaged with the labor market for longer periods of time, but also to get the opportunities to really change their careers when, when they choose to do so. Uh, and I think this, there's a lot of potential in this narrative uh, if you emphasize the opportunities that are attached to this. The opportunity to change uh, something in your life, to change something in your career, opportunity to do something uh, for your children and so on. Um, so I think there could, there's a lot of potential for this progressive uh, narrative. And at least uh, that's uh, basically just a short answer to the question by Anna about the upcoming German elections. I think there is a lot of uh, uh, untapped potential here for this kind of progressive narrative in Germany. And uh, hopefully we can we can mobilize a little bit of this at least in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, governments have mobilized historic funds to, to respond to COVID. So some estimates talk about around 8% of the global GDP in the first wave alone. Uh, so how can we use these unprecedented funds for the sake of another looming crisis, namely climate change? And uh, since this is a panel on intergenerational justice, I will start with uh, the compatriot of Greta Thunberg, uh, Mr. Shikarabi. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think the main issue here is the fact that we have to um, address the question of the power of politics. I, I became uh, active in the social democratic youth movement in the beginning of the 90s. And since then, generations of, of new activists in politics, they've been, they've been heard that, that politics do not have uh, the power to change. I, I remember the, the, the debates in the, in the beginning of my, my political activities and and the right-wing uh, parties in, in Sweden really managed to create the feeling of limits of politics. We will not, you will not be able to change the society, change the life of the people with the tools of politics. The free market is the answer. So now, if we want to address climate change, if we want to use the, uh, the experiences of, of this last year of, of, of the pandemics, we have to realize that we have to re-establish the power of politics. We have to show uh, our citizens that it is possible to, to change a society. And it is possible to change in a society with uh, the tools of, 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 of the political power. We can limit markets. We can uh, strengthen cooperations between different countries. We can we can change the social orders of a, of a society with the, with the help of, of legislation and redistribution of, 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 of capital. All these questions must be addressed by progressives and we have to, again, establish uh, the feeling that as a citizen, you are able to participate in the change of your society and politics is the platform for that change. Thank you. Uh, what about Germany with the rise uh, and the new wave promoting the Green Party? How can we make sure these historic funds are used for the sake of climate change? Uh, well, just we need to elect a green, the first green uh, chancellor. That's uh, that's an easy answer to this. <laughs> but of course, that's easier said than done. Um, no, I think. I mean, again, I think the Biden administration in the U.S. actually did a did a did a great job in in connecting this issue these issues together. The issue of job creation with um, the issue of uh, investment for climate change, and I think that that could be a potential. A solution to this uh, and how to connect these issues and um, uh, so obviously again it's about investment this this time maybe not so much about social investment but about actual public investment physical investment and uh, again in Germany we have a uh, pretty 
uh, uh, strong uh, inheritance of underinvestment in that respect. We, we need to invest a lot in, in uh, expansion of uh, the digital infrastructure, that's absolutely clear, but also uh, public transportation, uh, way, railways, uh, and um, yeah, okay, now I'm turning more towards a policy, uh, political standpoint rather than academic standpoint, but we've had, I mean, just to, to, as a reminder, we've had a, a uh, Christian Democratic uh, uh, um, Minister uh, for Transportation for the last uh, 15 years or so, and I think it really shows in the sense that, um, oh no, I mean the first Grand Coalition was a Social Democrat, if I remember correctly, but for a long time, I would say. And it really shows in the sense that, especially in the last years, um, uh, a lot of uh, emphasis was put on investment in uh, construction of uh, roads for cars. The Germans love their Autobahn, uh, but not so much in, in uh, uh, renewable energy and, and especially uh, the railways. And I think there's now, of course, a big potential for doing exactly that. Uh, connecting this also to smart investments in digital infrastructure, um, to smart investments in, in public housing, to, to uh, create uh, new building standards. I think there's, especially with regard to public housing, si I'm sitting here in a university that was built in the beginning of the 1970s, and it, it really looks like this. Um, so I think many of the, uh, this, this holds for many um, uh, buildings that were erected in that time. There's also a big uh, change. So, uh, a big um, opportunity here to to really w when once these uh, public buildings are renovated to to invest in, in green um, uh, building strategy. So I think there's a lot of potential. It's just a little, the question of political will. And I hopefully with the change in the federal government in in the fall, there might be a little bit more political will to 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 connect these issues than there has been for the past uh, couple of years. Oh, it looks like, thank you, it looks like social change from Automobile Club Deutschland to the prospect of the first Green Chancellor. Yeah. Exciting yeah. time ahead. But you've mentioned President Biden, uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity for Mr. Rivas to comment. There has been a new political opening in the US in January this year. What does it mean for the funds for the climate change? Well, we all hope and anticipate that um you know, it's, it's, you know, this is going to, you know, that uh, as a country and, and certainly here in California as a state that we're going to get back on track. Uh, we were making significant progress under President Obama. And uh, when, 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 uh, when President Trump was elected, um, you know, he turned back the clock in many, many ways, but certainly our state here in California, we've always been looked at as a climate leader, uh, but completely agree with what has been said um, in the sense that, you know, our climate crisis is undeniable at this point. Um, but the only thing holding us back uh, in making progress um, and in um, climate mitigation action uh, is politics. Uh, even in 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 our uh, very um, um, uh, our progressive state here in California, and so certainly I've been working on these climate issues for over a decade and all my time in public office, but I have not seen the mass mobilization, uh, the importance and the urgency uh, activating uh, around this issue as we see right now. And you know uh, what, what, what people are saying here in our state and, 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 and in our country uh, is that they're not gonna accept um, you know, these, 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 this, this, this inaction around climate um, and the way things have been done in the past. And so it's time for us to think very differently. And so it's incredibly encouraging. I know I was appointed to chair the Assembly Agriculture Committee this past fall. Uh, my focus and emphasis is, is, is to try to bridge this gap here in California between agriculture and the environment, um, leveraging um, our natural working lands, uh, looking at things like regenerative agriculture, looking at ways where we can not only focus on on, on reducing um, um, uh, uh, future emissions, uh, but doing what we can to leverage these, these negative emission technologies, carbon sequestration by utilizing the way we grow our food as the number one ag pr pr uh, producing state in the country. Uh, that's incredibly important. And so, it's, so what we're seeing, the action we're seeing from, from, from this Biden administration is very encouraging. Uh, their focus in, in incentivizing carbon sequestration and incentivizing ways uh, for us to think very differently about uh, the actions we take uh, uh, um, um, uh, for our climate. Um, is 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 uh, in the right direction. We're you know we're we're um, certainly on that path to to um, uh, reduce a lot of the damage that was done under the, under the Trump administration. But we certainly have a, a long way to go, uh, and and we 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 certainly have got uh, to get over the politics of the situation. Uh, and, and it's encouraging to know that more and more people here in the United States, here in California, care about climate. Um, but certainly we have a long way to go to make a real difference and to have 
uh, you know, the policy framework that will result in meaningful change. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the UK? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first of all, to your direct question about whether the existing funds have um, promoted uh, action against the climate crisis. I mean, in the UK, that has not been the case and it's been a frustration because right now is the time when, in fact, a lot of business in the UK is more interested than it's ever been in trying to fight the climate crisis, trying to also deal with the ecological crisis as well. You know, I really have seen a massive sea change over just the last six months to a year, actually, in that willingness to act on this. Um, so it's been quite frustrating, really, within the UK to have seen our government standing back on quite a lot of this when it's come to the use of COVID related funds, when it could have had a more conditional approach. I mean, looking forward, I think one of the big challenges is going to be ensuring that we have a much longer term approach to this, going back again to Marius's point about being long term. Uh, within the UK, there's a desire to um, have some uh, more regionally focused uh, spend, particularly on different, different capital projects. Um, but there hasn't been that commitment to the longer term infrastructural projects that will really make a difference. So, for example, in the north of England, we've seen, I think, 60 announcements or re-announcements of major rail projects um, over the last 10 years. We haven't actually seen any of them being started. So we need to see that really engaged action being taken. I, I would just say also, I think we need to be, you know, as, as Ardalan said, focusing on, on what we can achieve together now. People are excited about the possibilities. They know what we can do together. Uh, when we work together and, you know, in the UK and indeed in many other countries, we've seen how, for example, businesses, trade unions, local government have worked together to produce essential materials for the COVID effort. Again, we've seen in the UK how people have worked together, they've bandied together with their neighbours to support vulnerable people. Quite a few of those mechanisms can be turned towards environmental goals as well, you know, protecting local environments, ensuring the circular economy is functioning in different regions. Um, but, but we really do need to, I think, face up to some of the really difficult challenges uh, around the climate crisis. I mean, I absolutely agreed with what was said before around the jobs potential of this. And obviously the Biden administration is working really hard on this. But I think they are facing up to some of those difficult questions. I mean, in the UK, when we've had deindustrialization of one type, we generally haven't seen reindustrialization for the jobs that were lost in those areas. We've just seen a period of economic decline in those areas where previous workers moved out. And so there's a lot of cynicism around whether phrases of green jobs and a just transition are anything more than rhetoric. So obviously, for us as progressives, certainly for the Labour Party, we're working very intensively with the trade union movement and with businesses to say, well, where can we put in that retraining? Where can we ensure that there are those new opportunities? And where can we, for example, face up to difficult issues around carbon use? I mean, it, it looks on paper like the UK has reduced its carbon emissions substantially over recent years. We've done that when it comes to electricity generation um, but actually what we import has increased in terms of its carbon emissions by most measures. So we do need to be looking at those matters as well, because if we see domestic industry decarbonizing as it really needs to do, and it must do much more rapidly, we have to then also ensure that there's more of a level playing field as well. And, you know, I think we as progressives have got to grapple with those more difficult conversations and, and not kind of sweep them away. You know, they're exactly what we should be focused on now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we are wrapping up the session before we give a voice to the audience, I'd like you to make a one minute statement uh, that will be action oriented. So what can we do for future generations in terms of uh, decreasing inequalities? Uh, Mr. Rivas. Well, certainly, you know, as was mentioned um, by some previous speakers, you know, highlighting our common interests and really focusing on engaging um uh this generation uh, to get involved you know certainly that makes all the difference in the world here in california i know um voter uh participation has increased because of the opposition to you know the opposition and the threat that uh, mr trump 
um, you know, had on our state and our country. And so that really drove the interest of, of many to get involved. Um, and so certainly having um, uh, increased involvement results in progressive policies that benefit uh, more and more people. And, and so certainly engagement and, and uh, inclusivity is something that we need to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annalise Dodds. Sure, thank you. A very big question for one minute. I mean, obviously, I would say our first act has to be to face up to the climate and ecological crises because they will be the biggest issues for all of our societies, particularly uh, for many young people into the future. Um, but of course, we've got to focus on increasing opportunities as well. Just as Robert said, we need to make sure that those opportunities for political engagement are there but then those opportunities for indeed social mobility uh, for the future. That does mean education and involvement. It also means tackling those really critical issues for young people in the UK, like access to housing and labour market insecurity as well. But those solutions are not going to come from the right of politics. They can only come from progressives, ultimately, from those on uh, the left and centre of politics. So we really need to make sure that we're setting them out. Thank you. Minister Shikarabi. <laughs> Okay, so maybe um, Professor Buzemaya. Yeah, I try to be brief. Uh, I mean, I think uh, if you want to boil it down to three bullet points, I think the, the first one of mine would be to cre creating an equal playing field because it's become increasingly tilted um, over the years. Uh, the, the, we mentioned the issue of housing. Uh, we mentioned the issue of uh, 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 generational inequalities emerging. Uh, I think it was Annalise who mentioned health inequalities, dec even declining life expectancy for certain groups. So there's something uh, uh, that is that is that is really um, worrying here, and uh, we need to restore an equal playing field for uh, everybody in society. And in order to do that, um, we need to adopt a more long-term oriented uh, approach to policy making that focuses on these uh, uh, social and physical investment issues uh, rather than uh, uh, looking just uh, uh, towards the next election cycle, but really trying to to go beyond that by by focusing on what's good for society, eco economy, and also politics in the long term. I think that that would be would be my number one uh, priority. And then the second one, maybe this issue that Robert mentioned before, the, 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 heart, at the, heart, the deal at the heart of the American dream and maybe also the European dream or the, the promise of uh, welfare capitalism, if you put it in, in more broader terms, uh, is that, that hard work should, should pay off. I mean, that, that people who really try to um, uh, invest in their education, in their employment careers, that they should also uh, get something in return for this and, and uh, that there should be an equal, again, that's comes, coming back to the equal playing field, but also in terms of not, not to starting positions in life, but also the chances of upward mobility across the life cycle. Thank you very much. Uh, now let me give the, uh, the voice to our audience. Thank you uh, for all the amazing questions you've just uh, sent us. Let me start with the question of Adela Damek. So um, one of you said about a consensus that economic inequality is a massive problem, but there is no consensus of what the causes are and the solutions should be. Um, how do you think about that? What arguments, strategies and narratives can convince people that the left is right? <laughs> Any of the politicians can, can, answer, can pick this up. I mean, I, I'm happy to have yeah. a first go if, if others would, would like me to. I mean, I think we've talked a bit about this in our discussion, actually, Anna. Um, I mean, first of all, it is about that focus on, on the evidence. Uh, for example, in the UK, the fact that so often for conservatives, uh, poverty, for example, has been linked to unemployment. They've tried to suggest only in their words, not mine, workless households are those who are falling into poverty when the reality is just different. So it's it's presenting that evidence, um, including around wealth, as, as Marius said. And then I really do think it's about linking those factors to people's everyday lives, you know, making sure they understand that we um, on the centre and left of politics really understand the pressures facing them and that they're linked to these issues 
of inequality and then empowering people, showing that we can create that change to make things better, that they're not uh, kind of fallen from the sky. Uh, you know, very often I, I've talked to people on the doorstep, they've said that they're struggling financially and perhaps said, oh, if they could only get a few more hours or if they could only reduce their costs somehow. And I've said to them, well, just about everyone in your street has said the same thing to me. This is not a problem with you. It is a problem with how our economy in the UK is structured. So showing people there can be a, a different solution, I think, is very important. Thank you. Uh, Paul Tubelman is asking that um, discussions on intergenerational, intergenerational justice often come back to the fact that children have no lobby. Uh, there are a few champions that stand up for the next generation. And without these champions, it's hard to find political tractions. How do you suppose such champions, apart from uh, Greta Thunberg, can, might be found? Um, I, yeah, I'd be happy to try to answer the question. I think yeah. that's a you know a great observation. Um, you know, as a um, a policymaker myself, you know, uh, so many within the halls of of, of uh, the state capital of our state capital um, don't have a voice. Whether it's you know farm workers, whether it's children. Um, and you know certainly any policy um, uh, you know that 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 um, we are focusing on is always driven by um, some sort of special interest uh, with high paid lobbyists and and um, backers and, and, and so you know um, but I think a, a lot that has been said on this call and on this panel is uh, engagement and and you know certainly you know citing these examples that exist uh, in all parts of the world and all parts of our communities um, and, uh, you know, finding, um, you know, these common interests amongst uh, liberals and conservatives, um, uh, you know, everyone has a story to share and tell and, 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 and you know, essentially highlighting uh, the, the facts, whether it's using data to talk about these disparities we have seen here in California through COVID-19 or even prior when it comes to housing or educational, the lack of equity and educational opportunities and, and uh, access to to, um, you know, uh, equitable uh, educational um, uh, opportunity, you know, all that stuff exists. And so, but certainly rallying around um, these issues um, uh, and, you know, increasing um, uh, interest within the public um, uh, around these issues makes that job of, of uh, identifying some solutions that much easier, but certainly requires a lot of work. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Matthias Fisterer is asking, how should political debates pick up the topic of intergenerational justice with regard to the upcoming pension crisis in countries with skewed demographics? So what should we do about the fact that there is a pension crisis looming? Maybe if I, I could try to respond to it uh, in my early uh, Career as a researcher, I did some work on pension politics uh, or pension policy. So, uh, thinking back to that period, I may may try to give an answer to this one. I think it's it, it, this is one of these issues where uh, again short-term concerns meet long-term uh, concerns, and it's very uh, hard for um, the uh, concerns of uh, for the long term to prevail in these contexts. Because it, to give a concrete example, in Germany we. Um, we just uh, there was just a report a few days ago from a from a policy advising committee that shows that that uh, or reminds basically people because we've known that before that that we will have a severe problem of um, low pension replacement rates in in about 15 20 years uh, uh, and uh, years before we had debates about uh, old age poverty uh, but uh, there, there are some interests, uh, both organized, but also within the population more generally, who, uh, again, this is about framing, who then frame these arguments about old age poverty as saying we need to increase pensions for the current day pensioners, even though compar comparatively speaking, um, <clears throat> these pensioners are get, still getting a pretty good deal, uh, especially compared to the uh, future pension, uh, pension generations. Uh, and so what has happened in, in, uh, in the last five to 10 years, um, when there was more fiscal leeway, uh, more money to, to be spent in Germany, is that we've seen an expansion of some of the 
pension rights. Uh, for instance, we, we had a, uh, a delay of early retirement again. Uh, we had a, a more generous pensions for, for women who are with, with children in, uh, in the early 90s. And many of these reforms are justified. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is all uh, wrong. But of course, um, it, it, it does, these kinds of reforms do not really solve the long-term problem of underfunding in the, the, the pension system. And uh, uh, so far in, in Germany, the, 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 there's a real risk, I would say, uh, that uh, uh, at least uh, the, the so-called Volkspartei and sort of the old mainstream parties of the right and the left are um, maybe um, uh, 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 succumbing to some of the short-term urges because they, they, the electorate is also growing older. So I would say that is, that's at least something that, that we need to be aware of and that, that may pose a risk um, uh, to, in the long term. And so I would say um, what, what can be done about this is to, to uh, yeah, that's, that's me, the academic researcher speaking again, to take this kind of academic analysis seriously that show that there will be a long-term problem uh, coming and it's not actually that long-term in the future uh, and not to, um, uh, to take into account both this long-term perspective and, uh, and the more short-term concerns for compensation. Thank you. Since our time is up, I'd like to thank our distinguished guests. I'd like to thank uh, the audience for all the insightful questions. And I'd like to uh, invite all of you to please stay up uh, with us for the final session. Uh, Florian, Tania and Diego will wrap up and share their personal highlights with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>